I would imagine for most of you, you're like um, the Coleman household. Some of your favorite memories of family is when you're around the table. That was true in our Linda's home, true in our home, and then when we married, that was true for us as well. When the children came along, there was such great memories, and now with the grown children and grandchildren, even, even more special to have all 14 of them around the table and to be able to share uh, in, our, in our family. Some great memories. One of my, f- my favorite memories, though, around the table occurred our Thanksgiving, the, our first Thanksgiving as husband and wife. And we were about 110 miles south of Melbourne, West Palm Beach, going to college. We came up for the Thanksgiving weekend. And of course, uh, with both our parents living in the same hometown, both moms wanted us there for Thanksgiving. And so we uh, had a plan. Actually, they had a plan. My mom uh, was going to have a later uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Our Linda's mom was going to have an earlier Thanksgiving dinner. And they, they worked it out amongst themselves. So, uh, so it would be when we got to Arlinda's home, and it was Thursday morning, Arlinda's mom was running late with dinner. And so we're sitting down to eat, and we're eating away. And then my mom calls and says, we're, we're early, we're ready, and everybody's sitting here ready to eat. All right? So I wound up eating at Arlinda's mom and, of course, kind of you know, eating a full meal. I didn't want to disappoint my mother-in-law. And then we get to my mom's, and of course, I couldn't hurt my mom's feelings. I was sick as a dog that night, all right, (laughs) on Thanksgiving night, having eaten two big Thanksgiving meals. And so it is a memory, maybe not the best memory, but it is a memory and uh, that our Linda and I shared together. After that, we started alternating and kind of worked out a different kind of plan for our our holidays. But I want you to take your Bibles. Let's turn to Mark chapter 14 because we have a story where there were two meals in one night. Jesus participates in two meals in one night. I want to share this this story with you. In the story from Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, what Jesus is doing is he's celebrating for the very last time the Passover meal. And we'll see why in just a few moments. But for the very last time, Passover meal is being celebrated by Jesus. But he's also instituting the first Lord's Supper. Some of your Bibles may say Last Supper. We use the word communion. We use the word Eucharist. The word Eucharist means means Thanksgiving. And most often, though, we use the word the Lord's Supper. Jesus is defining the moment of the last Passover, but he's also inaugurating the first Lord's Supper. So I want us to to see this. Now, as Christians, we're not required to celebrate Passover, but there are many things we can learn from Passover. I want to share those with you this morning. So let's begin with the last Passover. For 1,500 years, Passover had been celebrated from the time Israel left Egypt until the time of Jesus Christ. About 1,500 years had, had gone by. In Luke chapter 22, verse 15, Jesus says, I, I eagerly want to celebrate the Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was eager. Why was he eager? He was eager because it was going to be the last one. It's why he came. No longer did they have to worry about all of these animal sacrifices. And, and the, it was just a shadow of the real thing that was to come and was to come in Jesus. So he's eager to let that go by and, and to no longer have to do Passover, but to institute the Lord's Supper, celebrating his death and, his, and, and giving of his body for our sin debt. But in the preparation of Passover, there had to be some time when they really did prepare. So your Bibles are open. Let me just begin reading for you in verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, Go into the city. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. 
The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Here it was, the Feast of, of the Unleavened Bread. That occurred right before Passover. And there had to be some preparation time for the Passover itself. It didn't just happen. There had to be some preparation that went on. Now, Jesus undoubtedly had made some arrangements because he was in and out of Jerusalem all week long, what we call Passion Week, leading up to, to Passover and Good Friday and then the resurrection. So he was in and out of Jerusalem. He had made some arrangements with one of the followers. And the cue for these disciples would be a man carrying a jar that was so unusual. Even though the city was overrun with pilgrims for Passover, Normally that was a woman's task, but here a man would be carrying it, and that would be the signal, follow him, and which they did. Now when you, it speaks about the preparation, it first uh, you have to keep in mind that one of the basic preparations for Passover for every Jew was that they had to clean the house. They had to clean all the yeast out of the house. We're reminded in Exodus uh, chapter um, 12, these words, for seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat the unleavened bread. Now here, they would clean the house of all the yeast. They would clean all the, the yeast spores, the, the, the food products. All these things would be taken care of. And they would make sure the house was clean. In fact, you, this happened in the spring. Passover was always in the spring. This is where we get the phrase spring cleaning. It comes from this, this time when they would clean the house of the yeast. So God was saying in Exodus chapter 12, get rid of it. Why? Because in the Old Testament, yeast stood for evil. It stood for sin. And so here in the symbolism of it, get rid of this out of the house. The house has got to be clean. But it's a symbol of our lives, getting our lives. The Jews had to get their hearts and lives right to be able to celebrate the uh, Passover meal. And so one of the parts of the preparation, get rid of the yeast. Another part of the preparation was securing the Passover lamb, the lamb that would be used without spot and would, uh, without blemish. Normally that took, care, uh, took place on Monday before Passover. Remember Jesus comes in on what we call Palm Sunday. The next day, Monday, that's when they would secure the lamb. And so these disciples had already to, probably taken care of the lamb, securing it, and either that lamb was with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, where Jesus stayed, or maybe with the other disciples on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Pilgrims would come, and they didn't have a lot of hotel rooms to stay in. They had to camp out, and they would camp right across the way in the midst of all those olive gardens that were across from the, from the temple, that's where the, possibly they kept the lamb. But on the, on the Passover meal day, on this Thursday, they had to take the lamb to the priest. And the priest would have to sacrifice the lamb. The blood would be sprinkled on the altar. Some of the meat would be burned on the altar. Some meat would be left in the hands of the priest because it was the responsibility to Jews to take care of the priests in this matter. And then a third part of the meat was to be taken and to be used that night in the Passover celebration, the Passover meal. They also would have to secure some items for the meal itself. Wine, they'd have to make sure there was some apples and nuts, possibly other fruit, some parsley, some, some hyssop branches, and, and some water. And I'll explain that to you in just a moment, why for all of that. But that was the preparation. They had to prepare. But now another part of the celebration of Passover for the Jew was that when the ceremony started, the leader, which normally was the father of the home, he would make sure the story of deliverance would be told. And so they would talk about the deliverance, rehearsing the, the, the story from Exodus 6 to Exodus 12. And in there, they would begin to, to just share the story, retell the story about Israel exiting out of Egypt. Now, remember that when we leave the last chapter of Genesis, chapter 50, everything is fine with the Jews. Joseph is there uh, with all of his family, and uh, they, they are having a great time. There's a lot of joy. They're very prosperous. 
But in Exodus 1.8, it says there rose up a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. And so they were put, uh, made into, slave, uh, into slaves, into bondsmen, and they had to begin to, to labor. Uh, they had to work out in the fields. They had to make bricks and mortar and for their constructions, for the Egyptian construction. They were made into to slaves. This went on for 400 years. And during this time, the people kept crying out to God, kept crying out to God. And at the time that God was ready in his sovereignty, he brought a deliverer. After 400 years, he brought Moses. And so Moses would come, and God said, you tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And, of course, the Pharaoh refused. There was nine plagues. He continued to refuse. On the tenth plague, that plague was to, to have all of the firstborn. The death angel would fly over on that night. All the firstborn, all the animals, and of the family, the firstborn children, would die. Except for the Israelites, their firstborn would not because they were to take a lamb, they were to slaughter it, spread the blood with hyssop branches all across the, the doorposts, over the lentils and everything, and the death angel would pass over them. They were to take the, that animal, after uh, killing the animal, they would take the animal and roast it, and they would eat that, and uh, during that time the angel was passing over. And so this would be a celebration of their deliverance, that God was delivering them from the death angel. So all this would be rehearsed during Passover. Now I want you to look at the symbolism, because the meal itself has some deep symbolism. Uh, a few years ago, we had a, a gentleman from Chosen People, which uh, uh, is an organization, a Messianic Jew organization, and uh, he had been a rabbi, and he had been converted out of Judaism into Christianity. And he would go around and share the Passover meal. He would share what we call the Seder, which is the order meal of what the Jewish families will do every Passover. And so it's really interesting. Now, when, the first, when they first did it back uh, during uh, the time of Moses, they were instructed to wear their belt, tuck their robes in, have their sandals on, have a staff in their hand, and they were to eat standing. And, and just like Israel had to hurry out of Egypt, they were to have that same kind of attitude when they partook of the Passover meal. And so in that tradition, there were certain things that they had to do. To begin the meal, they started off with a prayer of thanksgiving. And after the prayer of thanksgiving... <laughs> there would be the sipping of the wine. The wine would be doubly diluted with water, and so everyone would drink of the cup. And after the first sip, and the first sip uh, stood for sanctification, they would wash their hands. And this would be a symbol of the cleansing and that they were coming before a holy God. They wanted to be clean before they came before God. Then they would dip some parsley into a bowl of salty water. And the salty water was to symbolize tears. And they were to taste of the, that salty water, reminding them of the tears that Israel experienced while they were in bondage. At that same time, they would take uh, apples and, and any other fruit they may have, and they would crush it and mix it with, with nuts. And they would add some horseradish to it. And they would mix it up like a paste. And they would take the unleavened bread flat bread since it didn't have any yeast in it didn't rise it was flat bread they would take pieces of it and dip it into the paste this was to symbolize the mortar which was used for laying of the bricks and it was to symbolize the suffering that they went through after that they would sing the high el which is uh, the hebrew word for hallelujah we've sung it a couple of times this morning but the Hiel was made up of six psalms, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. And they would sing the first two of those psalms. Then they would sip the, sip the wine. And then they would take of the, uh, a roasted uh, boiled eggs. They would taste of it. And that would be a sign of mourning and a sign of judgment. And then they would sing two more or four more of the hymns, hymn 115 through 118. And then they would take a third sip 
of the wine, passing the cup around. And this would symbolize their redemption, that God had heard their pleas and he was sending them uh, a deliverer. They would eat the lamb and uh, symbolizing the sacrifice uh, of the blood that spared them in their deliverance. And then finally, they would sip the fourth uh, uh, time, the wine, passing it around. And this was to symbolize rejoicing. And then they would end their service by singing Psalm 136 and speaking about the everlasting love of God in their life and that his love is everlasting or lasts forever. And so that would be their Seder meal, their Passover meal. It would take about three hours to go through this. But it was the symbolism, it was a, a memory tool so that they'd be able to share from generation to generation to generation what God had done for Israel. So that was the last Passover. Jesus was celebrating that with his disciples. We don't know all the sequence, but in between all of that, possibly there was a lot of different interruptions in teaching and some other things going on about the, that Jesus was about to institute the first time the last supper we call it or the lord's supper so let's look at this let's look at the first supper the lord's supper and as we pick up the story in verse 17 notice in verse 17 when evening came jesus arrived with the 12 john macarthur makes the case that maybe this was a secret place and only peter and john knew about it they are the disciples luke chapter uh, 22 uh, verse 8 actually says that it was Peter and John that went and took care of the arrangements that day. And that it was secret, maybe to keep it away from Judas, uh, so that he wouldn't play his hand uh, quicker than, than Jesus wanted him to. But they go to the place, they arrive with the twelve. Verse 18, while they were reclining at the table eating. Now notice that they were reclining at the table. Now I told you a while ago the tradition was that they were standing with their robes tucked under, with a staff in their hand, their sandals on, uh, as if they were in a hurry to leave. But that tradition had given away now to a more leisurely three-hour Passover meal. And they're reclining. They're around a table. Maybe they're propping their head up with an elbow, eating with their other hand. And their legs are prone, stretching away from the table. Maybe it was a circular table. Many of us have seen Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. And you've seen that picture where Jesus is in the middle, a table and chairs like we're accustomed to. Six disciples that way, six disciples this way. Photographers saying, now look at the camera and say cheese. All right? That's kind of the picture you get from, from da Vinci's painting. But that's not how it happened. It didn't happen. It didn't look anything like that, except maybe the clothes. They were reclining around the table three hours participating in this in this meal now we continue in verse 18 truly i tell you one of you will betray me one who is eating with me they were saddened and one by one they said surely you don't mean me when you read the other counts you you just get the feeling that there is some guilt maybe going on and rightfully so. They were human. We're human. We've all done things we're ashamed of. We've done things we shouldn't have done. And from time to time, Satan brings these back to our mind. And we have a guilty conscience. Yet the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And yet we have to be, have to be honest that these disciples, just like us, maybe something popped back in their mind. Sure, surely it's not me. Or how did you know, Jesus? They were sad. In verse 20. It's one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. Now remember, they've been participating in Passover. They all dipped in the bowl. They all used their little flatbread and dipped into the, into the bowl. So no one knew who it was outside of Jesus. The Son of Man will go just as it's written about him. Just again reiterating his prophecy that he was to die, he would suffer. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Now here uh, in that last verse, in, in verse 21, I, I think maybe Jesus is reminding Judas there still was freedom of choice. 
maybe giving him one last opportunity not to do it. I mean, he, he had a choice. Maybe Jesus has given him one opportunity when you read all the other accounts. Maybe to finally come to faith and really believe that he was the Messiah. But no, he, he continued on in his deceit. The other accounts tell us that he left. He left them. And notice in verse 22, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. We'll talk about this in a moment. But while they were eating the Passover, he stops them. Now we're going to stop right there for a moment because Judas is not there. God wouldn't allow sin to be in the presence of Jesus Christ when he's giving us the Lord's Supper. So that reminds us of preparation. Just like there had to be preparation for the Jew, there has to be preparation for us as well. Remember, they had to get rid of all of the, all of the yeast because that represented sin, that represented evil. So in our lives, spiritually, we have to prepare ourselves by getting rid of any sin that may be in our hearts right now. Paul will say this in 1 Corinthians 5, 6. You, uh, your boasting is not good. Don't you know a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. Folks, a Christian that has sin is really a contradiction. If you've got sin in your life, that's really a contradiction of what we ought to be. We're supposed to be an unleavened batch. There's not supposed to be evil, not supposed to be sin in our, in our life. God says, get rid of it. Just like he did in Exodus 12, he's saying it to you and me. Get rid of it. And just as the yeast symbolizes the sin that was uh, uh, in bread, so for us as well, we have to pause, we have to take time. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says that before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to stop, we need to examine ourselves. I hope already that you begun, have begun to think about that for your own life. That you're, that you're using this opportunity to let the Holy Spirit speak. If there's something conscious that you haven't dealt with, then let's, let's be quick to go before our Lord and confess it and, and prepare ourselves. And, and if it's something that we need to make restitution for, let's do that after this service is over. Or maybe there's something unconscious and, and just pray, God, pierce my heart if there's something I'm not aware of. Pierce my heart, bring it to me. The scripture tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we prepare for this Lord's Supper, may we do that in our hearts and our lives. If there's any lingering yeast in our hearts, let's take care of it. But also, let's let this Lord's Supper, not only as we prepare ourselves for it, let's be reminded of deliverance. Because this Lord's Supper is a reminder that we too have been delivered. Jesus tells us, uh, or uh, John the Baptist tells us in, in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist rec recognized that Jesus was that Passover lamb. Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Peter would tell us in 1 Peter 1, 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, our, our defect. Folks, we are redeemed because of the precious blood of Christ. There was no way that we would ever be rescued for eternity saved by the blood shed by the Passover lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as Israel had to be delivered out of slavery, so we have to be delivered out of the slavery of sin. We are in bondage to sin. And Jesus delivered us, paid the price, so that we might be able to have salvation and that we might be able to enter into his very presence. So our Lord's Supper time is a time to think of the preparation, get our hearts right, and the deliverance. But there's also significance in the symbolism. Follow with me beginning in verse 22. While they're eating, Jesus took bread, and we had given thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said, Unto them, truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. That verse 25 is a reminder. When we enter into eternity and we find ourselves during that millennium and the, the, the earthly reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to participate in the marriage feast of the Lamb. 
and we're going to have a great celebration. I think that's what verse 25 is all about. Jesus is talking about that time when we'll all share together once again with him in this great celebration. But the bread and the juice, a reminder, the bread symbolizes that broken body of our Lord. All of that sacrifice, all of the beatings, the scourgings, there on the cross. And then the blood, the blood from all the whippings, the blood when his hands were nailed to uh, that crossbeam for his feet when they were nailed as well. The, the crown that was, that, of thorns that was, that was crushed on his head and blood flowing down the spear up his side. The precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we take the bread, it's the broken body. We take the juice, it's the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, bow with me right now if you would please. Your heads are bowed and eyes closed. If you haven't already prepared, would you do so right now in prayer? Just go before the Lord. The Bible tells us we're not to come to the table unworthily. Now, that doesn't mean perfection. If it was perfection, none of us would be able to partake of the Lord's Supper. None of us ever will be. We strive for it with the grace of God. But we do come in admitting our sin, confessing our sin making things right at this moment before him. And as you pray, think of the deliverance. You have been rescued. You have been delivered through the precious blood of Christ and his broken body from the, the payment of a sin debt you could not pay only he, innocent, without sin, the only one that could ever accomplish what God required, his son Jesus. He gave him up freely, and Jesus was obedient even unto death. And as you pray, thank the Lord that in the symbolism of the bread and the juice, we are reminded of the cost, the broken body, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us now, Father, as we share in the Lord's Supper. In his name we pray, amen. Now if you will take your cup and just remove the very top part and get your wafer. And let us eat of the bread. Take this, eat. This is my body broken for you. Now let us open the juice, part of the cup. And as Jesus said, as we saw just a few moments ago, this is his blood representing the new covenant. And we taste of this in remembrance of him. Verse 26 says, they sang a hymn and went out. But before we sing our hymn... I'd like to share with you a part of the Passover meal that you may not have been aware of. I wasn't until just a few years ago. But it points, there's a part of Passover, what they do at the end of the meal, that points to a beautiful picture of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the Passover meal, the Father will take three pieces of flat bread. And he will take the middle piece of the flat bread and he will break it in two. And then he will take it and place it in a napkin. And he will tell the children to close their eyes, hide their eyes, and then he will hide 
the flat bread, the middle piece, broken in two, now wrapped in a napkin, he will hide it. Not such that it can't be found, but he will hide it. And he will put it aside. And then for the next three hours, they'll have the meal. At the end of the meal, he'll ask the youngest child to go and find the napkin with the broken piece, broken in two piece of flatbread. So again, it's not so it cannot be hit, uh, couldn't be found. It's, it's easy. So the youngest child goes and retrieves the napkin with the broken pieces, and he unfolds it. And what this is called is a Hebrew word, which means dessert. Now they're about to participate by breaking the flatbread. Each individual get a piece. And this is their dessert. There's great rejoicing as the youngest child finds it. And so they now are all taking a piece of the flatbread, symbolizing the rejoicing that it's been found, the dessert, and that this will completely satisfy them, that they need not to eat anything else. They're full and they're fully satisfied. Now, can you see the symbolism of our Lord Jesus Christ there are three pieces of flatbread representing the triune God God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit the middle piece is taken and it is broken in two symbolizing the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ dying on a cross and then he is placed in a grave he's wrapped up in burial cloth and he's hidden away for three days and on the third day the women disciples they come looking for the body and they find that Jesus is alive and there's great rejoicing that Jesus is alive and we're reminded that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ Remember he called himself the bread of life? When we take of the bread of life, it is the appetizer, the meal, and the dessert all wrapped up into one. Jesus fully satisfies. And there is no need for any hunger because he satisfies, meets all the needs of our life. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Maybe there is a an older child here, a student, young adult, older adult. And you've been coming to church and you've been participating in various activities. Maybe you've read the Bible, you sing the hymns, you participate in many things, but you've never made a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. You've never followed him truly as a believer. You've never committed, you've gone through the motions, you're doing all the outward things. But you've yet to receive Jesus, surrender your life, and become a child of his. Would you not partake of the bread of life? The one who gave his body to pay your sin debt. The one who went to the cruel cross. But the one who was buried in a tomb, and he rose again the third day. It's not enough just to have intellectual knowledge about him. You've got to have a hard experience. And it begins with a surrendering of your life to him. Would you surrender your life to him this day? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for the one here who may need to know you. May they pray this simple prayer. We call it a sinner's prayer. Where they just say to you, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of sin. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. Father, help them to see just the simple prayer begins the wonderful adventure we call the Christian life. But Father, help them to see it's not enough just to have made that decision. They need to make it public. Just like Jesus publicly went to a cross and died for our sin, he wants us to be believers that are not publicly ashamed of following you. So we pray, Father, that they would have made that decision. They'll want to make it public. They'll want to come forward when we give a public invitation. 
but they would want other people to know there's been a change in their life because of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for all of us. And Father, I pray that there may be somebody here who, who wants to become a part of the church family here and that they would want to make that public today to become a, a member of this wonderful church. Bless them as your Holy Spirit speaks to them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.